quick sing along. If you will open your Bibles up to Philippians chapter 2 is where we're going to be today. Philippians chapter 2. I, I told you earlier, I am so thankful to be here and to be with you. It, it has been a crazy week. It, it started last Sunday. Sunday morning, I uh, was here at the church and I asked Cassidy, if you'd bring me some, some breakfast. And so she stopped by her favorite place, which is Dunkin' Donuts. And just for the record, Starbucks is much better. But it's a constant fight in our house. So she, she brought me something and I didn't think much about it. I ate it. And what I didn't know is they messed up the sausage and put the impossible meat on there, which would be fine unless you're allergic to mushrooms. And so by the time I got done preaching last Sunday, I thought I was going to be sick. <laughs> dealing with having a little bit of uh, an allergic reaction to breakfast and then ending with getting a phone call yesterday morning from my mother that my sister had had a wreck and so she's fine she's here she's a little swollen um, the van was on its side and the kids were hanging around in the car seat but but praise God everything was fine but it's just been a crazy week and, and so I am just thankful for each and every one of you and and I'm thankful that we are in the moment that we are in this series, that we are talking about community today. See, we've talked about our different foundations. We started with the Word of God. We've talked about worship and discipleship and prayer. But there is an important aspect to the Christian journey, and the foundation we need to stand on is that of community. You and I are not made to do this alone. So let's look at Philippians 2. Verse 1, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any con consolation of love, any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your word will be spoken. That you will remove any distractions. You will remove me and let it be your word that is proclaimed today. And that we draw close because we open up the word of God to reveal who you are. Let us draw close to you in these moments. We pray all these things, your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Well, we live in an interesting time. We live in a time that is all about our personal ascension. It's all about how we climb the mountain of life to reach the pinnacle of success. Whether that's in careers, whether that's in families, whether that's in who has the most stuff, our society says, keep climbing the mountain. I was talking, this is not just for out of the church context, I was talking to a pastor and when I go to a pastor's conference, here's the question that gets asked all the time and I hate it. So how many people are you running at your church? Because the question really bases down to this, how do I validate my church? Am I bigger than yours? Because that means I'm more successful. Uh, we all have this tendency to want to climb. But what Scripture continuously tells us to do is to lower ourselves. It's not, hey, collect the most stuff. It is, hey, proclaim the gospel. It is not reach for success. It is make disciples. And we have this situation where instead of climbing up the mountain... Our call as believers is to go down the mountain. It is to descend because we have the exa ultimate example of that in Christ. And, and so what we see here in Philippians is Paul is writing a, an encouragement to the, the church in Philippi and he's saying, here's what you need to do together as a church. Here's what you need to do as a focal point. But if you go back a couple of verses, I want to kind of jump back there for just a moment. It says this in verse 27. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about the things that you are standing firm in, one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, 
not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. Since you were engaged in the same struggle that you saw, I had, and now hear that I have. See, Paul is writing, and in in verse 27 through 30, he's really writing about outside challenges to the church. And, And it's so easy for us to read passages like this and focus on, yeah, the church faces a lot of of outside pressures. The church faces outside struggles. We know this because we see churches, Canada for example, the laws that are being passed in Canada are saying that if you proclaim biblical truth on gender identity and sexual preference, that you could be arrested for proclaiming those truths out of the gospel. You see people continuously feeling like and maybe it's proclaimed a little bit too much, but we start recognizing the persecutions that our culture does not like the church. Again this week, there was a big push and, and on social media to talk about tax the church because the church is a scam. See, we have outside forces. We have outside struggles. But here is a truth that I heard from, or read from Winston Churchill When there is no enemy within, the enemies outside cannot hurt you. Here's my burden today. In the Western church, sometimes I feel like there's more enemies inside it than outside it. We could narrow that down and sometimes we feel like those enemies are within our own community. I I read a story when I was studying this passage and it talked about a church in England that was wanting to have two or wanting to have pastor a pastor come in, the new pastor, and there were two dynamic groups in the church and each one had their own personality and their own thought about who the new pastor should be. So unbeknownst to the other group, they both scheduled a pastor to come in on the same day. Rather than communicating with one another, And rather than the pastors taking the example to say, hey, wait, this is not going to be how it is, one pastor stood on this side of the stage and one pastor stood on this side of the stage and they tried to out-yell each other. I read of another story of a church in Dallas who years ago had a split over some issues to the point that they began to fight over the money and say who's going to get the money and they had to take it to court. And it was all documented in the Dallas newspapers. See, these are big examples of the enemies within. But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't have to be that outlandish to be enemies within. And what Paul's addressing here is that we need to stand together. See, he starts this conversation in, in 27 through 30 using military language and athletic language of team and, and bonding and that the only way a military stands strong is when you stand shoulder to shoulder with one another. Because if you have a weak link in the soldiers, that is where you're susceptible. For you and for I as the church, if we are not proclaiming the gospel truth and focused on that as our primary care, then we're going to create enemies, or at least anonymity in the camp. That's not to say that personal preferences don't matter. I know they do. You don't want to be in a place that you're not validated, that your opinion doesn't matter. But it means that at the end of the day, what's the priority? In all honesty, what I've seen... And this you can take in all areas of life, whether in politics, whether in family, whether in church, just anywhere. When compromise happens, usually nobody is fully satisfied. And that's okay if we know that we're compromising what we agree is the right color for the carpet because we are focused on proclaiming the name of Jesus. We're compromising on which style of music is played because we're focused on does it proclaim who Jesus is. 
we're compromising on the unimportant things because we're focused on the most important thing? Or do we want to be as known as the church that divided because of this issue or that issue? See, this is the challenge. Before we can have any effect outside of these walls, we have to be a united community together. And that's what Paul is saying in Philippians 2. So let's take a look at it. Verse 1, this is what he says. He says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Paul is drawing to remind, this is what the gospel has done for you. He's given four points for the church in Philippi to hold on to, to recollect of the supernatural in their lives. To look at what God has done through Jesus. And so the first thing he says is, if there's any encouragement. It's not a question of if. A better word would be, since there is encouragement in Christ. Since you have found encouragement through salvation, Paul is summoning the experience of salvation when the Holy Spirit came alongside of them and comforted them. This is not something that is only true to the church in Philippi. It's not only true to biblical churches. It is true for you and for me if we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That you have experienced the encouragement of Christ. That you've experienced that He said He loves you enough. That He said He chooses you. Yet so many times we don't hold on to that and remember that. And so we're like children looking and searching for the attaboy that God has already given us through His Son, Jesus. It, it's funny, Killian has, Killian's playing hockey and so he has games on Friday night and Cassidy and I have realized, I don't know why it took us two years, but there is like a restaurant above the ice rink. And so we finally started going, hey, why don't we sit up there so we can see everything? And so Friday night, we're watching and Killian skating and he does something. And then as he's skating back our direction, he looks to make eye contact to make sure, did you see that? You, you saw what I did, right? Sometimes we do that with God. Hey, hey, you hear, you hear what I prayed? No, He's already accepted you and given you that encouragement. So just know that He has chosen you. And, and Paul is saying, remember the encouragement that the, the Holy Spirit gives you through salvation in Christ. He then continues with the second. He says, that since there's comfort from love, referencing Christ's love that they realize, so that they will realize that there's unconditional love by Christ. You should have comfort in the fact that you're loved. What do healthy marriages have? The comfort that their spouse loves them no matter what. What are a lot of marriages missing in this world today? That we know that there's spouses that don't choose to love their spouse every day. See, we've romanticized and you hear stories and uh, especially from younger people, you hear stories like, man, I, I just can't imagine them being with somebody for 50 years. I can't imagine having someone in my life that long. I can't imagine knowing what it is to choose love every day for somebody that I think might get on my nerves at some point. I, I will tell you, the wisdom of you married couples that have stayed committed and chose to love your spouse even in the midst of when they do something particularly us men, when we do something stupid. Man, that is an asset that my generation needs you to pour in and show us how to do it. We need people to show us how to choose love. Because that's a comfort that we're missing in marriage. And that's sometimes a comfort we miss in the church. Christ chose to love you. You do not have to seek His love. He has already given it. So respond and live through His love. And Paul is saying, look, you are loved. You are not having to prove yourself to God. He loved you enough to send His Son. And then he continues as the third recollection. And if there's any participation in the Spirit, it, that's the English Standard Version. Our, the CSB says, any fellowship with the Spirit. 
It, if there is fellowship, we, as Baptists, we love fellowship. Especially if it involves fried chicken. That, that is fellowship. Fried chicken, deviled eggs, we can, call, we, can, we can figure out a reason to have it. The truth of the matter is, is that Paul is saying, since you are connected to people, since you have come together, you have a partnership in the gospel. You and I are a partnership to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, to make him known. We each have a responsibility to do that. Now, we all have different gifts. We all have different giftings and abilities. But we all have the responsibility because we're a partnership in this. And so what that means for fellowship is that we come along each other and say, Hey, your gift is this. How can I support that? And how can I be along with you? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says... In one spirit we are all baptized in one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink one spirit. In other words, we are not against each other. We are together. I've seen way too many times growing up in church, serving in churches. I mean, sometimes we look for how many different ways we're apart. Sometimes we walk into church and we assume that you don't like me because of something. I know a, a gentleman that's a couple years younger than me who will not step into church today because there was a time he walked into church wearing a hat because he was uncomfortable as a 20-year-old guy balding. And so he had a baseball cap on and there was somebody that walked up to him and goes, that's not welcome here. And so in his insecurities, he took that to mean he wasn't welcome here. And we need to stop looking for that and realize if we have faith in Jesus, we're in one spirit. And if somebody walks in the store and they don't have faith in spirit, then it's our job to work together to share the gospel of Jesus and let the spirit move in their life. You and I cannot save people, but we can hinder the spirit from working if we're hateful to people or not welcoming to people. And then Paul continues. It says, if there's any affection or sympathy, sympathy, in our translation, mercy, more exactly, the divine compassion and mercy that Christ himself gives to us at salvation. Jesus said it this way, Blessed are the merciful, for they, have, they shall receive mercy. Are we merciful to people? I, I, I will tell you, one of the things I've learned in 10 years of marriage, which isn't much, I am much more merciful with people outside of my marriage than I am with my spouse. Because my first inclination is, you know me the best, how could you do this? You know me, why would you? It's easier for me to have a stranger do something to me and go, hey, no worries, things happen, than for me to give that same grace. In a church, sometimes we do the same thing. Well, you, you know Jesus and you go to church with me, you should know not to hurt my feelings. You should know not to do this. Do we extend mercy to people? Do we, when somebody's having a bad day, do we just write them off as just a jerk? Or maybe just the fact that maybe they need somebody to, to love them. Or maybe they don't mean the words that they say the way they come out. Some people talk fast, and when they talk fast, it comes off as harsh. They're like, whoa, whoa what did I do? I've got 3,000 things going on and I just got to it quickly. What, what do you want? We need to share mercy and affection for one another. We need to love one another. We need to walk hand in hand. And when we make a mistake, it means we have conversations. Paul is so emotionally compelling. He has taken the Philippians back to the grace moment Memories of supernatural work in Christ's salvation. He points to what Christ did in their lives to explain how they are to live and where to go next. He talks about to maintain unity and mutual care in the church. And so we must. It's necessary if we are to live a life worthy of the gospel. So let's look at verse 2. 
make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose. How do we complete the letters of Paul? How do we complete the work of the gospel? How do we complete Scripture? By being in one spirit, in one love, focusing on what the call is for us. To go and make disciples. We need to be in one spirit, looking. Going back to verse 27 when he says, let your life be worthy of the gospel. Part of that life of worthy of the gospel is being united in the gospel. That we are in one spirit, working in the same mind. So the unity Paul emotionally enjoins by recalling the supernatural that the, is, is the realities that the Philippians experienced when they received the gospel. It is gospel-oriented men and women working together to do the gospel work that Christ has set out for us. I hear reports quite often about how the church has lost, the church is on a steady decline. The evangelical church in America is on a steady decline. We don't have as many members as we did back in the 70s and the 80s and then the 50s. And I will tell you this, that is 100% true and we see issues culturally. But I also know that sometimes to get ahead at work, in the 50s, you had to be part of the Baptist, First Baptist Church down the street. The church isn't a country club. And so, yes, I don't want to see the church numbers decline, but if, if it means that people that weren't here for the purpose of the gospel, but they were in the purpose of self, then they weren't in the church in the first place. Right. Our goal should be this, and I truly believe... You want to reach other people? Then we be unified for the work of the gospel. This should be the most different place that anyone walks into during their week. Because they, they can see gossiping. They can see back talking. They can see backstabbing or, or just separation at their jobs or anywhere else that they go. Here, it should almost be uncomfortable how well we get along. That how well we love each other even in the midst of our troubles. Paul is saying that to say have unity. Paul was so passionate about this that he cared little about himself as long as the church was getting it right. Though he was in prison on a capital charge, chained, guarded 24-7, afflicted by those who should be his friends, with execution at hand, rested his joy in Christ and the gospel, insisted that his joy would be complete if they lived out their unity in the gospel. That is our priority. Paul, in a place where you would give him some grace if he said, hey, can somebody help me out? Or woe is me, is saying, no, no, no. Make my work complete by being unified in the gospel. And then let's keep looking, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Paul is, ex is demonstrating a, a humility or a lowliness that is so hard for you and me to find. I mean, it, it just is. Like we sometimes get stuck in our own world of it's about me and what have I got to do? But we get lost in this. Egotism gets in the way of gospel mission. Paul is painting this, this idea that we need to be humbly looking for the benefits of others not for our own glory. There's a story that I read about a man that preached at Southern Seminary. He wanted, he wanted to see the grave of A.T. Robertson. He was a New Testament scholar. He, he wrote a book called The Grammar of the Greek New Testament. 
And he was also the son-in-law of a man named John A. Broadus, a New Testament scholar, and one of the founding professors of Southern. Robertson surpassed him in credibility around people. And, and so as this, as this preacher had preached at the seminary, he asked the president at the time, Hey, will you, will you take me to his grave? I just would like to see where he's laid to rest. I know it's here. And he said, absolutely. And so they go to the cemetery. And the president of the seminary points out this giant monument. It's a large enough monument that it casts a shadow on other graves. And he said, you see that there? And the guy says, wow, is that it's beautiful. Is that A.T. A.T.'s grave? And he said, no. So that's John Broadus's grave. A.T. asked to be buried in the shadow. Are we ever okay being in the shadow? Are you and I satisfied knowing that we're in the shadow of other people? I think sometimes we pursue the light because it's natural for us. Because if we don't, without the light, we feel forgotten at times. But we are in desperate need of community to come and surround us and for us to look and say, hey, the needs of others are as or more important than my needs. I was convicted this morning of, of something, and it was from my kid. I, parenting's rough because it convicts you on all kinds of stuff. I didn't, nobody told me about that. That was not in the manual. Killian and Cassidy are helping me by putting the, the dividers of the letters in, in the yearly giving report. And as they're doing it, Killian finds that he has one, that he has a, a giving report, and he got so excited, he said, I've got a record of what I gave to the church. I will tell you. I just sat in my office for a moment like, man, have I ever been that excited about giving to the church? Bless his heart, he pulled it out and he opened it. He said, I gave a dollar this year. I'm like, that's fa-. Like, he's seven and he's excited because he feels that he contributed to the church. And I just sat there and I went, why did I not get excited about contributing to other people's lives and to the church like he does? And you would think that I would be really invested in that. But he has a different heart than I do at times. The innocence of a child where he's not looking for his own celebration, that he's part of something that he believes in. It just reminded me of what being humble looks like for us. In this, Paul is writing, everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but for also for the interest of others. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says it this way, I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that many that they may be saved, be imitators of me as I am in Christ. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. The living a life worthy of a gospel-driven life. Paul is saying, put put the focus of other people. We, We live in a world where community has changed and and neighbor has changed. If you don't believe me, go look at new houses being built. There is no investment on a front porch anymore. Back porches are the importance of the house. And then we put up a fence so nobody can get into the back. Like, we, this is our space. But there's something beautiful about the fact that there's a big porch with chairs and swings sitting on it. it the house feels more welcoming. It feels like part of the community. Are we so focused on getting in the backyard, getting safe and secure that we forget the community around us? It's a challenge for you and I. See, Paul gives this others-oriented call 
And he says, this is what our godly mothers and fathers did. And, our, and we are called to live out every day. We 